We're, we're going to go ahead and get started to make sure that Gene has all the time that uh, um, that we have uh, possible with her here. Um, I'd like to help uh, have you join me welcoming Gene Caroon from Goody Clancy, Architects, Preservation, and Planners. Sure. They're a Boston-based firm um, that does a wide range of projects. Uh, Jean's the head of their preservation practice. Um, she is a fellow in the American Institute of Architects. She is a fellow in the Association for Preservation Technology International. She is a fellow in the US GBC. Um, any one of those is uh, an amazing recognition, but to have all three um, I, I don't know of anybody else that, that could say that. She's literally written the book on um, greening existing buildings and looking at issues of climate change and sustainabilities with existing structures. Um, she's got a, a long list of, uh, of awards and projects, uh, including um, one of my favorite is the Trinity Church in, in Boston, Massachusetts which if you haven't been to, you need to put on your list to visit, particularly those are young architects um, who, are, who are here. She's been working um, for a number of years at St. Elizabeth's campus at, um, for, in Washington, D.C. for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. She's been working for the state of Vermont, the city of Boston. She's also the former chair of the Historic Resources Committee for the AIA, as well as the president of Boston Society of Architects. So quite an accomplished uh, career. Just old. And just getting started. <laughs> so um, we're very, very fortunate to have Jean come uh, today and speak to us about the reuse of existing buildings and the role that they play uh, in our communities and in the preservation and the sustainability movement. So please welcome Jean Caroon. Well, since I've been friends with Jonathan uh, and Tom, Tom uh, Collins for decades, it seems like that's long overdue that I would come visit your remarkable school. I remember Jonathan presenting about some of your programs at the National AIA conference, and I was just blown away. And that was probably a decade ago, so it's, I think it's only gotten better. Um, uh, but thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here at a fun day. So as, as uh, Jonathan said, I am a principal at a firm called Goody Clancy in Boston. It's a success, so Goody Clancy were the names of the original partners who are deceased. So we are a firm that's been around for about 65 years. We're probably in the third generation of leadership. We're actually an employee-owned firm of about 70 people now and uh, with uh, seven principals that are the board of directors and guide the firm. We are a bit of an anomaly in the architecture world these days because we only have one office. We only have about 70 people. We routinely compete against firms that have many thousands of people and multiple offices. Um, but we like uh, being in one office. We work across the country. Uh, and the joke with me in particular is that I work wherever JetBlue flies. Um, but actually, I broke the rule for Indianapolis, so you should be pleased. I came on Delta. It was a real <laughs> transgression of my personal style. But uh, uh, our firm really has, takes very seriously the fact that we are mission-driven. We have the, the great luxury of working for exceptional clients, both in institutional and uh, in government. And we really try very hard to practice what we believe the world needs to be in changing it. So we are signatory to the Architecture 2030, which is really just about reducing energy and water use. But we are also uh, signatory to an initiative in Boston about uh, women equity. And we are very public about what our salary base is for everyone in our firm. We are uh, the first architecture firm in Boston to become a just organization, which is something created by the Living Futures Institute and is a social equity platform, which puts all of our HR policies and our salary information up on the web for anyone to see um, and to, to judge whether our family uh, support systems are as good as others are, or should be. Uh, but we, we actually, on Friday of last week, 
uh, just actually three days ago, we had two Tufts professors spend the afternoon in our office doing a, a, a workshop on unintentional bias. And I had to laugh because when they were, we're 70 person firm, we have a sort of auditorium like this, and they, they were funny, they said, we made them feel at home because nobody sat in the front row. Um, so they felt like they were truly teaching a class because even in, a, in, a, in the uh, office, no one sat in the front row. But thank you for sitting in the front row. That's very nice. Uh, so that's who we are. We have, um, we have for a long time called ourselves an architecture planning and preservation office. I think that we are actually moving away from that. I think in our new strategic plan, we probably won't differentiate that way. We feel uh, that our projects are really interwoven, that it would be, it's unusual to be able to classify a project as one or the other. Um, and that the, the strength of this multidisciplinary approach, the fact that we have people that are architectural historians and preservation specialists and, uh, and, uh, and planners and, uh, and designers is really part of what creates a, a really fertile ground for uh, creating solutions that are most appropriate for ever, wherever we're working. But this is just an example of some of our projects that could be uh, choreographed or stereotyped within that. We have a, a fair and ever-increasing academic portfolio. We actually are probably moving to the fact that we are most comfortable in working in the, in the education sector. We really like the uh, intellectual challenge of, of what you, what schools like Ball State bring and what they challenge us to do and what we are trying to learn in order to better serve what education sector needs. Uh, we really believe the education sector is the way we're going to change the world, uh, both by teaching and by the kinds of buildings that we build and the way we help shape the campuses that we work on. I have a very unorthodox background. Um, I really pretty much frittered away my entire uh, period from 18 to about 31. Um, I had a lot of fun. I made about 12,000 a year. I think that was a high point, uh, dollars. And uh, remember, it was a long time ago. But uh, I didn't do anything that would qualify as a real job. Uh, I was a Whitewater River guide and, uh, and was on some of the best rivers in the world, actually. Uh, and made in a high point about $35 a day. But oddly enough, I really feel that those, that decade of working in the wilderness is really what led me to architecture in a, a, what seems so natural to me. But at the time, when I, when I announced everyone I was going to architecture school, uh, everyone that knew me, the reaction was, where is this coming from? What is this? Uh, and then my favorite was, well, you can't draw. Um, but I actually can draw. But now I don't have to draw because I just talk. And, um, and I point at things and other people draw. So it, it works out fine. Uh, but, but it really made sense to me because wherever I went, whatever wilderness I was in, um, whether it was the Grand Canyon, whether it was uh, a protected one of the uh, first wild and scenic rivers in Oregon is one of my favorite places, um, you would see human impact. It wasn't always as bad as this, but it was often as bad as this. If you've ever been down the Grand Canyon, uh, the canyons wash down from the up above, and they carry waste. Uh, it's not unusual to be on the Colorado River and be fishing out an oil container that washed down from the side streams. So uh, even aside from the fact that you're looking at invasive species, you're looking at controlled environments that are now not natural environments, you're looking at the impact of humanity on our planet. And that's what I was exposed to. And so in part of my sort of connecting it all together, I really turned to uh, sort of the language of the first environmentalist, John Muir. And I love the fact that his postage stamp calls him a preservationist. He was the founder of the Sierra Club. And in his notebooks, which he he had extensive notebooks, over and over again, he basically said, if you pull on a single strand of nature, you will find that it is connected to everything. Everything is connected to everything. 
And he said it in multiple ways and uh, over and over and over again. And I think that that's really where we as designers, whether as planners or architects or landscape architects, it is the beauty of what we do. We are connected to everything. And as we work on our specific projects or think about how we're working, we really are thinking in a very broad system-based way. And it is just endlessly exciting and an endless learning curve, which who would want more from a, a mission in life than to have a constant learning arc that allows you to always be reaching for something that you might not have realized in the last project or seen the opportunities for. So uh, for some reason, I saw that architecture was where I was going to go. It made perfect sense to me as an architect that I would, and someone who cared about the planet, that I wouldn't be recycling bottles, I would be recycling buildings. You know, why do we focus on recycling the smallest objects on our planet instead of the largest? Uh, if we are going to have a sustainable world, it just, it goes without saying that we are going to value what already exists. And what already exists are millions and millions and millions of square feet of existing buildings. So taking care of existing buildings, not just because I love the beauty of them, because I love the historic stories, because I love the drama that has happened inside and around them, but because it just made sense for the planet uh, has always been where my, my practice has been. Uh, this is actually the McCormick Federal Building in Boston. Uh, it was the first uh, uh, General Services Administration lead renovation, went lead gold. It was the reason I became a lead accredited professional because you needed that for the qualifications in 2002. And um, it also uh, has had, it had, we increased the density occupancy of the building by about 10%. Um, and we decrease the energy use by about 30%. But what's very interesting to me is as you try and think, there are no perfect goals for this because this building is actually the home of the Environmental Protection Agency in New England. And they pride themselves on having a flexible work schedule. A flexible work schedule plays hell on the energy use of a building. And so if you really wanted to drive down the metrics of this building and say that it used less energy per square foot than anything else, you would tell everybody that they had to be there at 9 o'clock and they had to leave at 4. And then they had to turn off everything and that was it. The fact that they're allowed to work from 7 until 7 at night uh, pushes our energy use up. But it also then blends out the transportation use because this is a building that's located close to public transportation. So there are no perfect metrics here. I know that your, your architecture firm, and thanks to, to Tom's leadership and others, your architecture practice your teaching really looks at energy use intensity, and that is important. But it is equally important when you remember, for those of you who know the Passive House Standard, that it is actually looking at the energy use per person. And that is far more of a bet metric than just the energy use per square foot. Because what I care about is how many people are using the energy, how many people are taking advantage of a building. If you've got a 10,000 square foot house that is net zero, <laughs> who cares? It's, it's still a stupid waste of resources. Um, pardon to all of you who have 10,000 square foot houses, but you know, maybe there aren't so many in this audience. Um, so anyway, in, in this, as you can see, I tend to get a little didactic and dogmatic, and so it was part of that was a, a book that I published about 10 years ago. So it's lovely and that it's completely out of date and that it still has some general say, things and some good case studies, but it's really great that it has long since been superseded by the fact that there's such a rising conversation about what it means to be sustainable and what it means to use existing buildings. And actually, even within the last year, there's been a real surge in this. Only last week, the U.S. Green Building Council, the world USGBC, published a report about embodied carbon. And embodied carbon is sort of shorthand for acknowledging the fact that every material we use has an environmental impact. 
Uh, and so it doesn't matter if it's, if it's a chair or a building or the flooring, every product, no matter how green, even if it's from a circular economy or ecology, has an environmental impact. And what, what the, the World Report and other reports have long been saying is we really need to be looking at our consumption patterns as much as our energy use. And this is a, is a statistic that I love to throw out. I'm a lot of fun at a dinner party. Uh, my children tell me my, that I, you know, my daughter just calls me Debbie Downer, for those of you who remember Saturday Night Live, a woman who could ruin any party. Uh, but, but this is really quite something that we have to take seriously. We we are, are consuming and creating waste at an unprecedented level, and our populations keep growing, and so the amount that each of us are consuming keeps growing, and that becomes, and a large part of this is really tied to the building industry. In fact, it's really believed that up to 40% or uh, even as much as 50% of everything that is consumed uh, in this country goes to buildings. In fact, um, I think in one of the statistics that I've read, the, the United States has about 5% of the world population, and every year we use about 30% of all the raw resources in the world. Um, so we, with, it's an equity issue as much as anything, but, um, and of that 30%, half of that goes into our building infrastructure. So into our roads and our buildings and everything. So we, with 5% of the world's population, are using 15% of all resources drawn off the planet in order to make the buildings around us, in order to create the infrastructure that we so thrive on. And that's, you know, that's just really not okay. We just can't do that. Um, and so we have to really think about the, the impacts of what we do. And for a while, this, um, you know, the story of stuff was sort of uh, out there depressing every sixth grader in the country that, that uh, the planet was going down, which is sort of true. But there's always hope, you know, if, if you, what's the point if we weren't here? But we, it is about the carbon impacts. And, and uh, when I say carbon impacts, like embodied carbon, that's, that's a convenient shorthand right now for environmental impacts because everybody's focused on greenhouse gas. But, but it isn't just about greenhouse gas. It's about pollution, it's about eutrophication, it's about uh, deforestation, it's about social equity, it's about the fact that, that, uh, that when we use tin in any of our building products or in our phones, well, it's a death sentence for people on the other side of the planet. And so this, this conversation that's becoming much more robust, that's very exciting, is really starting to take responsibility for all of these things. And it's sort of like everything that goes around comes around. You know, Rachel Carson wrote this in 1962, and actually the same year that Jane Jacobs was writing. And so it's, it, it's okay that we keep having these conversations over and over and over again, because I feel like every time we do, we make a little more progress. And I feel like that you young people, this is your what give me the energy to go back and, and, and keep going because I really believe that, that your century is going to be different than my century and I believe that you're going to make it different. And um, that's not going to say it's not going to be a little tough and there's a little bit of bad news along the way, but I really think you're going to change the world and I'm, I'm counting on it. Uh, I'll live as long as I can so that I can see as much as I can, but go for it. So this is just in every project that we do. Now, I said to someone today when we were talking, I really think the planners are the, are the, the game changers in, in the future. Uh, because I think these are systemic issues. But within my skill set, I'm not really good at thinking that broadly other than spouting bad data uh, or gloomy data. What I really love doing is working on individual projects. And so I, every one of us has to find where our talent is and then sort of capitalize on that. But so my projects are really about looking within the framework of any particular building, what are the opportunities. At the McCormick Building, part of the exercise is always sort of the what if. Let's just get together as a team. Let's Let's go crazy. Let's brainstorm about what if, what if, what if. 
Well, it's a little hard on young people in the office because you might only get to do 25% of what if. Uh, but it's really important to stretch out there and then sort of pull back and figure out why that 25% is the right thing to do. So we got um, quite a bit of research money, actually, back in the day we had money for this, to look at things like, um, we looked at, at things like turning the uh, putting integrated photovoltaics where the old spandrel panels used to be. We looked at using titanium dioxide, which is a natural cleaner, on the inside of the windows in order to remove the, the uh, to improve indoor air quality. But actually that turned out that, that although that would have worked, um, it was very bad for the environment because titanium dioxide mostly comes from the mouths of rivers. And so it was a really, had a very high environmental impact. So, but, but each time you do one of these explorations, you come away with a little more knowledge, and if you can actually get a funding source so you can publish, then you get to share the knowledge, which is important. But one of the studies we did get to do was looking at taking the, the areaway that was an old part of a, obviously, 1930s building and turning it into amenity. And it, this seems like, okay, this should make sense, but this, that meant we had to move mechanical equipment from the fourth floor to the 21st floor roof. That meant we had to pump things farther. That meant we used more energy. So what the analysis really looked at was if we added uh, uh, greenscape here, we added insulation, we added daylighting into the center of the building, was that energy trade-off adequate to justify this? And the, and the answer was yes. And consequently, this is the first green roof that the EPA ever did. And, uh, has become a huge building amenity uh, and a real draw for birds and, and uh, bees within the downtown Boston. Within other buildings, this is a project at Harvard. Um, this is actually an old McKim, Mead, and White building. Um, I guess that's sort of redundant, an old McKim, Mead, and White building. It was the, the freshman union, actually, in its day. And uh, we converted it into academic offices. And the big move here was to actually add skylights, which were approved by the local historical commission. We actually found them in the original drawings from McKinley and White, but they hadn't been put on the building. So we could convince the historical commission that they would have been comfortable, McKinley and White would have been comfortable with that. We added the skylights and, and then drove light all the way down through the building. And we significantly increased the density of the building by adding and adding daylight. I am a big believer in density without building. And push the density in every building that you have, allow buildings to have more than one family, allow in-law units, allow uh, more people to use a building. Uh, density is a, a key issue, but let's do it without building. Let's do it by taking advantage of what we have. And then as we remember, the holistic piece of things, as architects, we're responsible for how we leave a building. Uh, cleaning actually has huge environmental impacts and huge implications for our health as well as our, our chemical use and our health. So we are always looking at materials that can be cleaned just with water um, or brushed off even, uh, that don't require replacement, that have long durability. And uh, it's a, our biggest compliment is if the facilities people like us as much as the, the scientists and the academics who use our building. And it makes us feel good when the facilities people like us too. Um, it's important. This, this was a project at the University of Virginia. Uh, this was actually a building that was slated for demolition. Uh, they, they were going to, it's their largest uh, liberal arts cl classroom building on campus. Something like 9,000 students go through this every year. Um, and uh, they were going to demolish it and replace it with a building that has the exact same program. And uh, David Newman, the campus architect, challenged that assumption when he came on board. And we were fortunate to be hired uh, to transform the building rather than to replace it. And part of the transformation that we did was this is, it's called um, New Cabell Hall. It's down actually, if you know the University of Virginia, along the academical lawn, uh, there's a building at the end that some people think is, shouldn't be there. Stanford White closed off the, the lawn, and that's, that's um, 
old Cabell Hall, and then behind old Cabell Hall, they built new Cabell Hall and put this horrible little areaway between the two buildings. And we saw the areaway as this incredible opportunity for a new secret space. And the University of Virginia is just like secret garden spaces or what the University of Virginia is. So here we have this new secret garden space. And, and then they did something that, that contractors always love when architects do. We just peeled off the back of the building. See how easy that was? We just peeled off the back of the building and put a curtain wall there. And, uh, and the contractors were like, you know, really? But it did actually it work fine. It was a few structural machinations, but it, it added transparency to the inside of the building, which was very disorienting, and brought light into the heart of the building where we could have new student spaces. Uh, so this was to us the big gesture, and uh, didn't increase the cost of the project uh, through some, some good use of engineering and things like that. This is one of my favorite projects, actually. It's at the, in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, Champlain College, a little tiny school that's uh, winning accolades for being innovative. Uh, and it, it uh, this house, you know, whenever I was saying to someone, I have these moments when I, I walk, I think, I just have the best job in the world. And those moments for me are usually when, I may not even win the project, but when you get to go climb around in the attic or while you're doing the walkthrough, or you get to go to the basement, or you get to go, you know, I've been, to the, I've been up to the top of the tower of Trinity Church up the secret staircase. You know, those are the moments when you say, okay, I have a great job. But this little house was actually one of those moments, because this this is one of 11 houses in, in Burlington, Vermont, that predates the Civil War. And it had had two owners. And the last owner had lived in it for 50 years with eight children in one bathroom. And, um, and it, it, was like a, it was like time stopped. They hadn't touched it. They'd done all these renovations to it in, in like 1880 and added two feet, uh, that's the band around the top, and, and pushed out one of the windows. And it was just, the hardware in this is to die for. And it's just, you get to walk around these places and you just, I'd so, every detail is so beautiful. And, uh, it, but it had been, the college bought it. It was right in the midst of a historic district, which is largely residential that the college has sort of uh, taken over, and so there's a huge amount of tension between the, the neighborhood and the college. And um, we actually spent um, two and a half years on the design of one of the smallest projects in my entire portfolio because of the number of community meetings that we had and the fact that we actually, we did things like we laid out the footprint of the new building with chalk out on the lawn and put up balloons and poles to show people and, and people would walk by and they'd go, well, that'll ruin the whole neighborhood. And you won't be able to see the lake anymore. And we'd say, no, no, you can still see the lake. Yeah, stand right here and just, this is a way we see it, and, we, and uh, eventually, after three years plus or minus, we went into construction, and in Vermont, it's a wonderful state, in Vermont, if 10 people don't like a building project, even if all 10 people are siblings and live in the same house, if 10 people don't like a building project, they can file a protest that sends the project to land court, which means a two-year delay and roughly $100,000 in legal costs. So this was the first project that the college had done in two decades that didn't go to land court. So we took extra time, but we saved the college but kudos of money and pain because we got consensus before we went into to construction. And what we did was we took this wonderful little gem, it became a new um, welcome center, and we built an addition that we modeled after uh, the porches in the area, which are all additive onto the historic building. So we sort of used those proportions, did a huge amount of drawings, and, uh, and the, so the addition from the street side still feels very residential. It's still, you walk around the community, you don't realize it, but from the back side, it's really quite a big building. 
And, um, and what the, the college was willing to do, which I'm forever grateful for, is they allowed us to build the, the square footage that they needed in two wings that flank the historic building. So when you stand inside the historic living room, you still have the exact same view you had in 1860. Now, in historic terms, that would probably not qualify as a defining characteristic, although it might, but uh, for us, that was a defining characteristic. The idea that you could experience this house in the same way that you had experienced it for 150 years was huge. And it was really through the courtesy of the owner because having the two wings cost a lot more money because they had a lot more envelope and um, and it didn't have to be that way. But the other thing that the two wings really allowed us to do was we, we spend a lot of time on something called long life loose fit, which is something that, an idea that Stuart Brand came up with from the Whole Earth Catalog from his book, um, How Buildings Learn, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. And, uh, but the idea is that, that how buildings are being used now is not how they're going to be used in the future. And the biggest impediment in the reuse of buildings is usually the structural system. So each of these wings has clear span. We have no columns in these wings. So that the, the, they can reconfigure this building to their heart's delight. And we've joked that actually that third floor with the balcony overlooking it is going to make a dynamite master bedroom somewhere when this goes back residential. And they now have more than two bedrooms, two bathrooms. So, uh, But this is the kind of, uh, we also followed for this building, we didn't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't, it is a lead platinum building, uh, but we also followed, at this point it was Living Building Challenge 2.0, I think, maybe, maybe an earlier, but within the Living Building Challenge, uh, which is from the Living Futures Institute out in, Living Future Institute out in Seattle, they have this wonderful concept about beauty and places of delight. And uh, it was a central theme of this building that every single person who worked in this building, every area had its own place of delight that particularly in Vermont, Vermont connected you to nature, um, that you had a porch that you could go out to, you had a place where you could sit in the sun, uh, you had a place that really allowed you to experience the beauty of the world around you. And uh, that, that places of delight, remembering that buildings are for people is, uh, is really also part of the theme of all the work we do. Jolly Wynn mentioned uh, Trinity Church in the city of Boston. Um, this was H.H. H. Richardson's signature building. Many say it's the building that cemented his career or launched his career. It certainly was a building that put uh, the United States on the map architecturally. Uh, Richardsonian Romanesque is the only a style named after an American architect, and it, it really did go viral, which is interesting. I've had the great privilege of working on this building. Uh, they've been my client for 19 years. Actually, we're almost to 20 years this year. Um, but, but what I was charged with in January 2000 was really how to bring this building into the future and how to make this Episcopal parish, which is the fifth largest parish in the country, to make their home, not only to steward it, but to make it support their parish. Um, and, and, you know, like all historic churches, it was really focused around the sanctuary. There was not a lot of space for programs. Uh, and it's a very urban church. It's, there's very little land around it. And it's a National Historic Landmark. And it uh, sits within the National, uh, uh, National Register District of the Back Bay. And uh, it's eligible for Boston Landmark. So there was a lot of review, a lot of opinions about this. Uh, but one of the things that we did is we put in uh, a geo-exchange system. Not quite as large as yours. Uh, and in New England, it's a vertical system. So we have six vertical cores around this building, three in the front. If you go visit, you can actually, as you walk around, you'll see these little plaques in the, in the pavement that say something about well system. And uh, it, it they basically are holes drilled down through till you get to granite. And uh, they're actually um, 
1,600 feet deep. So if you're standing in Copley Plaza and you're looking at the Hancock Tower next to you, they're about twice as deep as the Hancock Tower is tall. And uh, you basically loop and mine the temperature of the Earth and use a heat pump system then to create. And the reason that these were valuable is because we were, we were adding air conditioning not to the sanctuary, but to 15,000 square feet of new space that we're adding underneath the building. And geo-exchange systems, particularly in New England, are most valuable in terms of us getting chilled water, uh, which is, is a hard commodity to have. So probably what we did for the church that was most valuable for them was not the geo-exchange system, but the fact that we looked at this space underneath the 19th century building and said, okay, this is your expansion space. This is what you have. Uh, you need meeting space. This is what we turned it into. Uh, it's, it's now about 15 years old. It's used heavily. It, uh, those pivoting glass walls are actually acoustic separation. They were fabricated in Germany. And uh, when they're closed, you have no acoustic, the, no transmission of noise. So we can divide this space into three different meeting areas. Uh, it, is, it holds about 1,000 people uh, for standing receptions. And the rest of the time, it's used by uh, the several hundred community groups, including, uh, we think this is the ultimate test. There's a high school group that uses it in summer for camp. And uh, they, they actually were our first big challenge, because you see the sort of metal bars that run up. These, the, the wood is covered in steel, obviously, or obviously for some. And the very first summer that it was used by the student group, they figured out that if you actually ratcheted on the metal handles and you did it enough, you could break the biscuits inside and spin the column. Um, so we had to go back in and retrofit to make it a little more challenging for them. I highly recommend teenagers as a test of any design. Um, they, they are, but but this, is what, this is what I'm talking about for people habitats. You know, this is really, we did amazing things at Trinity Church. We did some fabulous conservation work. But this is really about making this building work for their parish. And for me, as a lover of the building, the most important thing I can do is keep a healthy parish. Because if the parish is healthy, they're going to take care of their building. And I want them to take care of their building. So uh, that's, that's really where my practice is. And and what I'm seeing now is this awareness and expansion of an acknowledgement that existing buildings are the key to a sustainable future. And uh, we've been saying that for decades, but it's starting to really gain traction. Uh, the studies that are coming out, the, uh, the acceptance of it, the Carbon Leadership Forum, which is based out of the University of Washington, the USGBC report of last week, all of these things are focusing on existing buildings. Oddly enough, the New Building in Institute, which is sounds like it shouldn't, has really put a lot of energy in how you retrofit existing buildings. Uh, communities are focusing on this. The National Park Service is looking at the concept of reurbanism and has for a number of years. They've been uh, creating a really interesting uh, database where you can look at how reurbanism is working and how uh, your historic stock is performing. They use uh, Latimer Square in Denver as sort of an example of what, how you can seed the renewal of a city for Denver. It was an extraordinary example where they actually had uh, blown out, if you look at this just 1930, this is the fabric of Denver in 1930, and this is the fabric of Denver in 1975. So this is what uh, new urbanism, re-urbanism did to Denver. It blew away block after block after block, except for this little place up in the corner, uh, Latimer Square, where one woman owned a number of blocks and she wouldn't let them demolish the buildings. And she sat on those blocks until uh, you know, the renewal of Denver started to happen. And now Latimer Square is really the heart of the new Denver the new reurbanization. So what the the what people are starting to recognize is this this diversity of building stock, the history of building stock is uh, is really critical to how we experience and celebrate cities. And if as all the data is suggesting uh, that 
over 50% of the world's population is going to live in cities in, in the next 20 or 30 years by 2050, then we have even more responsibility to look at cities and think about what the existing fabric is and how to protect it. Because it's all too easy to blow it away and put a new expensive high-rise condo in. And the economics of cities really encourage that uh, removal and, and replacement. So the conversation has to really get very sophisticated. Even the conversation about green has for long pushed to remove all those evil existing buildings that use too much energy so you can build new green buildings. But it takes a long time for a new green building to pay off its environmental footprint. And we probably, uh, we don't have a long time. Uh, we actually don't have any time at all. Uh, so the sooner that we can start not uh, replacing bad with, with less bad, uh, the better for all of us. In, in New York, they're really looking at the blocks of the older, smaller buildings and have actually started to quantify the fact that that is where the greatest economic activity happens. That's where the most diversity of population is. That's where there's still some chance of affordability, believe it or not. Okay, maybe not in New York, but elsewhere. There are places where it still uh, gives you that kind of diversity. And so this reorganization, this recommitment to our cities and to what already exists is part of the, the national and even international conversation. Uh, particularly exciting for me is that within the United Nations, when Habitat 3 happened in Quito a few years ago, they identified as part of the Sustainable Development Guidelines that heritage was an essential part of vibrant cities. And you would think that that's a no-brainer, but it is actually the first time that a United Nations document identified heritage as a valuable asset and an essential asset to keep all of us healthy and happy and connected to the world. So we are starting to see these little chinks that are going to lead to a great uh, tipping point and that um, that the United Nations piece is what's called the New Urban Agenda. It actually has achievable platforms and it actually has cities and countries including the, some of the cities within the United States that are reporting out on this, that are looking at how they're creating better places. They have benchmarks that include spatial planning and what that means about how to promote planning. Uh, they rely oftentimes within the United States on the, the uh, database that the National Trust for Historic Preservation has created about reurbanization, which is doing overlays of data. And this is actually what's going to make the 21st century so exciting. You have access to data that we could only have dreamed about. And so one of the urban, one of the urban planners who works for the National Trust out in Seattle in the Preservation Green Lab got this idea that you could take the data from um, the Commercial Building Index, CBEX, and that gives you the age and energy performance of buildings in different cities. You could map that and you could overlay with that the activity of cell phones and the activity of credit card action so that you could see where the vibrancy of cities was happening. And no surprise that, as he said, his mission was really uh, to prove that Jane Jacobs was right, to prove empirically that Jane Jacobs had it right, that we want these sort of mixed-use neighborhoods, we want cities that are really uh, compelling, and we want to make demolition the last resort, not the first resort, that we need to make it really, really hard hard for people to demolish buildings. And I, I have my own incredible list on this. You know, my, my theory is, A, you should pay, uh, you should have to pay because you're going to demolish, because you, of the environmental impact that you're going to cause. You should totally not be allowed to put anything into landfill close the landfills and people will think twice about demolishing a building. And, uh, and you should have to pay the environmental cost for every material. It's not going to happen in my lifetime, but you might be able to make it happen. And um, 
One of the things that gives me hope about this is in my myriad hat, I'm, I'm actually on something called Architecture Boston, which is a, a publication, and we did this whole thing on ethics, which has been a hot topic in the last year or two. And uh, one of the, the things that was so um, wonderful to me was the editor, Renee Loth, who writes for the Boston Globe as an editorial, and. Uh, is, is just a brilliant person. Uh, she wrote this editor, that, uh, this editorial that pointed out that our ethical code is not something that was handed down to us. It is something that we have shaped, you know, through civil rights, through uh, advocacy, through law. We have changed what the moral behavior and ethical code is. And that is what we have to keep doing. We have to really change where we are, and we can do it. If you realize what we've done in the last 50 years, not enough, but one of the things at Trinity Church, one of my choke up moments was when we were working on the up inside of the church in this beautiful John Lafarge interior, um, we, we found a time capsule. And it wasn't a time capsule from 1876 when the church was dedicated, but it was a time capsule from 1950s when the, the last group had been up there working. And it was, a, it was a letter to us from the people that were working on the church. And it was really, um, it said, it said basically last week, Sputnik flew across the church, uh, flew across Boston. And for those of you who were in this room your age, you wouldn't remember, but the Cold War and Sputnik and the fear of missile warfare and the fear of what, the, what could happen now that we were all connected that way was a really powerful uh, piece of the 1950s. It's the reason in my entire childhood we used to have drills that if a nuclear bomb fell, you were supposed to lay down face down on the ground. That would take, that would save it, you know. But so, you know, this letter says, we're terrified. Sputnik flew across the church. And we hope that when you find this, that missile warfare is no longer a threat to this world. Well, when we found it, we had been in a church meeting when 911 happened. We were actually having a building committee meeting when the planes flew into the World Trade Center. And remember, in Boston, we knew the gate they had left from. We knew the people that were on those planes. And it was really, really close to home. And so when we left our time capsule for that, the next generation, we said, ha, didn't quite get the missile warfare thing down. But what we did get down was the fact that everybody that signed that letter was no longer a Euro European ancestry white male. No offense to all my favorite people who are European white males. But that letter, the first letter, was all men. It was all the Brahmins of Boston. The only woman on the letter was the church secretary. Our building committee was led by a woman. It was people of very diverse backgrounds, very different lifestyles. It, we had led that church through a period when, when gay marriage became acceptable and legal within Massachusetts. And we had made, there was real difference. And that's what we have to do. We have to make a real difference. We have to change things. And I believe that we can, and we have. And this is my sort of ongoing list of how do you create a culture of stewardship. You value what already exists. You look for economic incentives that make that important. You find ways to make it really uncomfortable for people not to value what already exists. And you always remember that we're doing this because it's for us. It's to have a beautiful, beautiful place to live. And the earth is our home. Thank you. We have a few, few minutes. Uh, if anybody has any uh, comments or thoughts or questions they'd like to share. This is just my ad hoc list. And you realize the reason I'm an architect is I'm not very good at policy. But I have, over the years, encountered things that have made me crazy. And we have worked in communities where it was illegal to hang your clothes outside on a line um, because it, it, it trashed the neighborhood. It's like, really, 
people, get over it. You know, yeah. So. No questions, Jonathan. No questions or thoughts? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, they are difficult in some ways. I didn't talk about uh, 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 we are being filmed here and taped, you know. So, um, but there is a certain irony. I, we are we have worked for a decade on uh, on something called St. Elizabeth's West Campus in in Washington D.C., which is an incredible privilege. It's a it's a 165 acre site, uh, 60 extant buildings. Uh, for those of you who are architectural historians, it was one of the first uh, uh, buildings that really followed um, it's called a Kirkbride Hospital. Dr. Kirkbride was a, a, one of the first psychologists out of Philadelphia, and he had this real idea that, that there should be moral architecture that helped uh, make people whole when they were mentally uh, uh, injured. And uh, St. Elizabeth's was started in the 1860s and was the only mental hospital for, uh, for veterans until after World War II. And obviously it became a little crowded. Um, and it is perhaps a little ironic that it is now the new headquarters for the Department of Homeland Security. I'm just saying, you know. And my family finds it quite hysterical that I work on a lot of mental hospitals from the 19th century. But uh, uh, they're a very hard building to reuse, so that's why they come to mind when you say that. They're, they're very linear, and uh, they've often been in the public sector for their entire lives, so they're, they're uh, often less than well cared for, and it, it becomes very, very uh, expensive to modify them. So. But they're beautiful buildings, and there are very few of them. There, there are sites if you go to the Kirkbride. If you look up Kirkbride on Google, it'll take you to sites where they're, they're all over the country. And um, they're just exquisite buildings. And they had this concept that really was called moral design, which actually sort of lines up with LEAD, the idea that everybody should ac have access to daylight, to fresh air, uh, to views, to nature. It's like, well, duh, you know? And, but I, I like that, that people, they tried to do that in the 19th century. Anybody else? Can you tell us a little bit more about your book and how you came to write it and is there a second edition or a follow-up planned? Uh, well, it is available online. Uh, thank you for asking. It's available electronically. And I have been uh, thinking about a second edition, um, although I'm thinking that actually uh, what we really need to talk about is a little bit more about resiliency rather than uh, sustainability. So the language has been shifting a little bit. And the, bill, the book, because it was written in 2009, 2010, it really uh, in some ways followed the, the structure of LEAD for water and energy and materials, which wasn't a bad organizing structure, but I think it's outdated now. It's, uh, so it's, I've been thinking about it. I have to, I can't say that out loud because I'm afraid my husband will hear that I've said that. And I probably should talk to him first, and my partners, because it does take a lot of time and energy. But it's a lot of fun. I mean, all of you that are academics, it's really, really interesting to go down these research uh, holes and, and figure out what's going on. And it's very hopeful, even as you're digging up all this dire data, there's so much going on, and there's so many people doing so many wonderful things. It's very uh, energizing but I don't advocate for doing it as a marketing issue. It takes a lot of time, maybe for tenure. You talked a lot about um, the reduction of use of energy and that kind of thing. What are your thoughts on regenerating energy and just moving us into the next step instead of just reducing, but actually generating clean air, clean water? energy and that kind of thing. Yeah, well, we, you know, I believe the people that are really leading the way on this are, are 
um, Rocky Mountain Institute, the New Building Industry Institute, and uh, the Living Future Institute. Um, but, but as a practitioner, uh, what we are, are seeing, which is pretty generally accepted, is we're moving to all electric buildings so that those electric buildings can take advantage of a green grid. Um, that, that if we assume the grid is going to become greener and more diverse um, using uh, renewables, then we need to be able to, electricity is the, is the metric for that. Although it is also, you know, the data on how much electricity is lost as it moves from the plant to the building is, is pretty horrifying. But, but the more focus that is on this, the more the technology will, will start to catch up. I, I think one of the things that I struggle with as a practitioner is the obsession with net zero buildings. Um, and I, for a long time, actually fought back against this and spoke out against them. The idea of a net zero building is theoretically that it, um, it produces enough energy to take care of itself. And I, I just think that's stupid. Um, you know, it, it's not a high, uh, photovoltaics are most efficient when they're used in large fields, not when they're put on each roof. I mean, you can put them on each roof, but then you have to have a different kind of, of, uh, of grid that allows you to back meter, and, and some places are actually pushing back against that because the power companies don't want it. And what I didn't like about net zero was I felt that it was driving us towards uh, deep energy retrofits because energy was the single metric of value, uh, energy use intensity. And so what we would see, for instance, in New England was a complete infatuation with a deep energy retrofit, which would come into an existing building, say, a nice wood-framed house, and just do what I call an internal teardown. They would just gut the inside of the building uh, uh, in order to add insulation and 12-inch uh, walls and, and new heat pump systems, et cetera, et cetera. And so would, would a, and then call it, and then put photovoltaics on the roof, and then buy whatever green energy they needed in order to make it net zero. And, and I felt like we were missing the point because we weren't looking at the density, and we weren't looking at the uh, environmental impacts of how much carbon we were spending in order to save carbon. And uh, it was, it's been interesting to me that just in the last few years, some of the groups like in New England, the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association, their conference last year was entirely about how much carbon was being spent in order to create a deep energy retrofit and whether what the payback was. And really a new metric where people are saying, if, if if we spend this amount of material uh, and we save this amount of energy, do we have a five-year payback? We're really looking for five-year payback. It doesn't do us any good to take an existing building and do so many wonderful things to it that 50 years from now, all the energy it saved is sort of leveled out. We really don't have 50 years. So we're really looking at where we can spend carbon uh, to save carbon. and so. Energy is a funny one because the, we just get, we sort of forget that it's all tied to everything else. And, uh, but we are seeing a real greening of the grid. It's not my area, but I do, um, we do push for all electric buildings. Um, and we do uh, look at, we, that building up in Champlain, we use ground source heat pumps there too, geo exchange, and, and uh, we're seeing a lot more air to air heat pumps. But, but I, I'm one of those people that if you say the word heat pump to me, that something happens in my brain and I immediately shut down. So I, I just can say it to you and pretend I know what it means, but I don't really know what it means. I just know it uses less energy, and it's a good thing. So, you. Any other questions? Thank you all for coming. It was very kind of you to come on Monday. Thank you.